Don't you dare woo woo! That is disgraceful! <laughs> oh yeah, I'm back and I somehow found yet another Monster Girl harem game that's way better than it has any right to be. If I had a nickel for every time that's happened, I'd have three nickels. That's not a lot, but it happened three fucking times. Once with Monster Girl Quest, a linear, story-focused, RPG-esque thing that I probably should make a video on one of these days. Once with Greener Pastures, a dating sim I did make a video on. And then there's Monster Girl 1000, an indie JRPG developed by Twisted Scarlet which is the subject of the video you're currently watching. I really like this game and highly recommend it. And for those of you wondering where I've been, I'll explain at the end of the video. So I'm going to do my best to avoid major spoilers in this video, as this game is quite the experience. But since a lot of the world building, character info, and explanations of the various magic systems are revealed bit by bit throughout the course of the game, I do have to talk about some hidden information if I want to discuss that stuff at all, and I definitely do. But I won't spoil any of the big reveals, and just about everything I talk about in this video is stuff you'll learn in the first half of the game. Oh, and do go show some love to Noah Novels, who voiced the intro hook to this video. He's a talented voice actor and he makes some great stuff. Link in the description. And with that, let's get into Monster Girl 1000. The premise is that we're in a fantasy world that's a bit of a mix of high fantasy and dark fantasy depending on the location, with a bit of gas lamp thrown in there for good measure. Which if you don't know is when magic is used for technological purposes. Okay, now bear with me for the next 90 seconds or so. There's a lot of background info coming your way, but it's all relevant to the core premise of the game. The primary conflict is that for as yet unknown reasons, the ratio of male to female babies has been slowly but steadily decreasing for several hundred years, to the point where it's starting to become a real problem, particularly for remote communities, though it's not at the point where it's actually rare to see a male. The nameable main character has just reached adulthood in the isolated Mistral Village, which is actually located in a pocket dimension created and maintained by the rabbit goddess of fertility, Alice. The protagonist's default name is Dante, so that's what I'll be calling him throughout this video. Dante wasn't actually born in the village, but he and his father were taken in when he was a baby, so it's all he's ever known. Additionally, once his father died from disease roughly a decade later, Dante became the last living male in the village, with the rest either dying or moving away, as the gender ratio continued to skew and the population dwindled. He was taken in by his elf friend Bessie's mother and raised like he was her own. Fast forward a bit more, and Dante has woken up after celebrating his 18th birthday the night before. He meets with Alice, who has a few things to say. See, Alice was known to be an isolationist, rarely allowing people into the village and only allowing one villager to go on trading expeditions due to her fear of losing people. In fact, the only reason Dante and his father were welcomed in all those years ago is due to the desperate need for men in the village. However, things have gotten dire and this policy was no longer sustainable. The population and the economy of Mistral Village were in terrible shape and something needed to change. So Dante and Bessie were given her blessing to go off and join the Hunters Association, which is this game's version of an adventurer's guild in the hopes that the money and connections they make will be able to help the village. Additionally, she gives Dante one more special task. Seeing as the population of everywhere is becoming an issue, he is to stem the tide as it were. His job is simple, bang 1000 monster girls or at least father 1000 children, hence the name Monster Girl 1000. At the Hunters Association test, Dante and Bessie meet and join up with a demon girl named Rey, forming a party of Dante the Warrior, Bessie the Ranger, and Rey the Mage. Together, they pass their test and go off to do hunter things, mainly helping people in need while also making some coin and training their skills in the process. And that's the premise. I know that was a lot of background to throw at you before even talking about the actual game part of the game, but I do think it's necessary to really understand what this game's all about. Pretty much nothing really makes sense without it, especially since the main party isn't even fully formed until like a half hour in. So let's address the elephant in the room. Monster Girl 1000 is an RPG Maker game, and I wouldn't be surprised if that puts you off a bit. And look, I get it. Since RPG Maker makes it extremely easy for just about anyone to put out a functional piece of software, there are a lot of generic and or shitty games that were built on this engine. And honestly, I also tend to avoid them. In fact, the only reason I ended up pulling the trigger on Monster Girl 1000 is because I liked the art style and because the girls featured on the promo image are cute and caught my eye. But I have to say, Monster Girl 1000 has a surprisingly complex combat system with dozens of unique abilities, passive effects, buffs, and a story that manages to simultaneously be silly, heartwarming, and over the top even by JRPG standards. To put it simply, even if you strip away the gimmick and the corny sexy fun that we all love, what we've got here is a good game with a good story, so try to look past its engine and give it a shot. 
let's talk about gameplay. Monster Core 1000 is a turn-based party-v-party JRPG featuring an upgradable hub and visual novel-style story segments. The game's progression loop is pretty simple. After completing the tutorial area, you'll be able to traverse the overworld and visit any of the unlocked zones. Once inside a zone, you can do a variety of things via a menu selection. You can visit the various residents and shops, you can purchase info from the information broker, and you can go on missions of which there are several types. Generally speaking, every mission in a standard zone can be categorized as a story mission required to move the plot forward, a side quest that's not strictly required to beat the game but is generally recommended for both story and reward, and repeatable quests which provide a persistent source of golden experience, scaling up in difficulty and reward based on how many times you've successfully completed it. This replaces the traditional JRPG grinding method of random encounters, which just aren't a thing in this game. One thing I've noticed about JRPGs in general is that each one has its own little quirks when it comes to combat. Each game has certain things you'll need to keep in mind, and they'll typically try to encourage certain playstyles. Some are all about being able to survive for a long time. Some are more glass cannony, and you'll want to end the fights as quickly as possible. Monster Call 1000's combat system leans very heavy into passives, buffs, and debuffs. Early on, you'll do fine with basic damage dealing abilities, but there will come a time when that just doesn't cut it, and it only scales up from there. So let's break things down. I already mentioned that your basic party composition is Warrior, Ranger, Mage. Depending on your gear choice throughout the game, you can also niche down even further. Sometimes you'll gain a fourth party member temporarily, but that's typically done as a gimmick for story purposes rather than something you're actually supposed to utilize strategically. So here's how the main party works. Keep in mind that there are literally dozens of skills, abilities, and passives that are innate to the characters, and I can't go over them all or we'd be here forever. So these are just what I feel are the most defining characteristics of each party member. Dante is the warrior of the party. That means he deals a lot of physical damage and he can serve as an effective tank with a bit of setup. He's also notable for being the one who directly impacts the stats of both allies and enemies. He has abilities that'll apply stacking buffs to the party's physical or magical attack and defense. He has single target attacks that serve as individual temporary stat nukes, invaluable when dealing with an enemy that's either really tanky as you can shred defense, or an enemy that hits really hard as you can debuff attack or magic attack. He's also notable for being able to use time magic, which can speed up allies or slow down enemies, impacting turn order. Overall, a very versatile character who can fill many roles depending on what you need at the time. Bessie is the ranger of the party. For starters, that means she's the go-to when it comes to flying enemies as they get a massive dodge boost against melee attacks. She also has a naturally higher crit chance than the rest of the group. Her deal is all about powerful effects attached to her single target bow shots. You got two different types of poison that deal percentage damage each turn, super powerful in the post game by the way, and yes, they do stack with each other. You got a skill that causes an enemy to take additional damage for several turns. You got the JRPG classic blind and silence abilities. You got a life leeching ability. Overall, if you want to really mess a single enemy up, Bessie's your girl. Her main downside is that she falls off in usefulness against large groups, and I think she's most effective if she takes a few turns for setup, which is rough considering she can only set up on one enemy at a time. She's also pretty squishy, so late and post-game fights can be rough, as you'll regularly come across enemies who can just whack the ever-loving shit out of her. But keep her alive and focused, and she has so much damage potential, and some of her endgame gear is legitimately kind of OP in my opinion. Rey is the mage of the party. If you'll pardon the Final Fantasy comparison, she fills the role of both white and black mage. She'll be your primary source of elemental damage and your primary healer. Additionally, she has a variety of powerful defensive support capabilities. In particular, she can give huge buffs to defense and magic defense, and her null abilities can cut incoming elemental damage for your party in half, assuming you null the correct element, of course. Null fire isn't going to do much against an ice spell. Her downside mainly lies in the fact that she has no significant physical damage output, which means she's mana-hungry and useless once it runs out. It also means that she's completely crippled if she gets hit with a silence status. On top of that, she can be moderately squishy. Not quite as bad as Bessie, but you'll want to keep her protected. I also found that Rey's offensive capabilities kind of fall off in the post-game since you have to deal with a damage cap, and she doesn't have as many ways to spread high damage across multiple hits. But as far as utility goes, she can't be beat. As a core combat unit, I think this is great. Each party member has their roles to fill, but there's a lot of flexibility on offer. Additionally, though I haven't talked about it yet, the game does end up pitting you against a wide variety of enemies, many with unique gimmicks that'll require different approaches if you don't want to get wrecked. Monster Girl 1000, just by the nature of its combat mechanics, manages to avoid the stagnation that many JRPGs fall into. I mean, come on, we've all seen JRPGs where you fall into a pattern and the fights all start to blend together. 
That doesn't happen in Monster Girl 1000, and I appreciate it. There's also a Limit Break-esque system, but I'm not going to talk about it too much. It's pretty underwhelming compared to the rest of the game's combat systems, and I don't find it very interesting. Pretty simple stuff. Each party member passively, or sometimes actively, generates TP in battle. When you max it out, you can use a special ability that drains your TP. It can be a powerful attack, a temporary buff, or a variety of other things. It's all different depending on the character, and you can unlock more of them as you play. If you're familiar with JRPGs in general, you've seen shit exactly like this. On top of the already pretty complex combat system, another huge factor in how the game plays out is equipment. See, the whole passives and buffs thing isn't just in terms of abilities, but equipment as well. You'll be able to access a wide variety of weapons and armor throughout the game. You can get these from enemy drops, quest rewards, and shops. Armor follows a strict tier system, and you'll generally be able to buy two sets per party member per tier, each set offering different passive effects that'll push the party member in a certain strategic direction. As an easy example, Rey will typically have a choice between armor that boosts her offensive magic or armor that boosts her defensive magic. Weapons don't operate on a tier system, but it is notable that attack values on weapons have an exponential curve, so even small improvements matter a ton later in the game. While some weapons find their identity in their unique stat distributions, such as a weapon that deals very high damage for that part of the game at the cost of speed and accuracy, most of them, particularly those that show up later into the game, also have their own unique passive effects that'll change up the feel of that character, at least in their attacks. For example, there's a weapon that does multiple lower damage hits and lowers enemy defense. Another will increase the rate at which enemies target Dante, but also give him a 50% chance to counterattack. Another deals bonus damage based on the user's missing health. One of Rey's weapons completely removes her ability to attack, replacing it with an all-stat debuff. These weapons are all really strange and interesting. More often than not, I find myself equipping my party based on passive effects rather than the actual stats on offer. And on top of all that, there's the blessing system. So in addition to a weapon slot and an armor slot, each character has a total of three blessing slots each. As you progress through the game and interact with various characters, for story reasons, you'll sometimes gain a blessing from those characters which then acts as a piece of equipment that you can give to your party members. These blessings do have stats, but that's not why you want to use them. Each blessing comes with a passive effect that is typically pretty powerful, and there are many unique effects that can only be obtained by holding a specific blessing. So there's blessings that provide resistances to various forms of elemental damage, which isn't the most exciting effect, but it's very useful in the right circumstances. There's one blessing that poisons all enemies automatically at the start of combat. There are blessings that'll increase the damage cap, something that becomes pretty important in the postgame. There's one that applies a stacking invisible boost to your stats each turn. There's one that gives you a max mana boost and converts a portion of damage taken into mana drain. There are literally dozens of these things. As I'm writing this part of the script, I loaded one of my saves at random and checked my inventory. There were over 70 blessings in the bag, not counting equipped blessings, and there was still a good portion of the postgame left on that save, so there were still more to collect. This system takes what I was talking about earlier about how you're expected to switch up your approach to combat from time to time and how Monster Girl 1000 has a lot of flexibility and just cranks up the scale. It can actually be kind of overwhelming, and if it weren't for the fact that these blessings are pretty much drip-fed to you early on, like it actually takes a good while before you can even fill up all the blessing slots for your party, I probably would have found it too much to keep track of. But by the time the game really started shitting them out, I was pretty much in the thick of things and could effectively parse out how each one would realistically affect me. Overall, it's a very unique kind of system. I mean, passive-focused accessory slots are nothing new, but Monster Girl 1000 takes it to a whole new level, and I kinda love it. Now, I'm giving the combat of Monster Girl 1000 a lot of praise, and don't get me wrong, it's well-deserved, and I walked away from this game loving said combat. But there are some pretty deep-rooted issues with the game that can't be ignored. Firstly, the early pacing kinda sucks from a gameplay perspective, and that's probably the nicest way I could put it. There are three difficulty modes that you can switch between in the overworld. There's an easy mode that makes combat a formality by design, there's the standard difficulty, which is what the game was ostensibly balanced around, and there's hard mode, which ramps things up but also boosts certain resource drop rates. For clarity's sake, just know that I played on the normal difficulty the whole way through as I feel like it's the intended way for the average person to play. So the combat system is foundationally really good, and there were plenty of memorable fights that tested my limits and forced me to approach the mechanics in new and unique ways. But it took like 15 hours of gameplay to get to that point. The game's progression was such that early on, I just kinda had to keep smacking the enemies as hard as possible and I would win, provided I reacted to obvious things like using Bessie for flying enemies and having Rey cast the proper null spells. Aside from that, there was zero real challenge for quite a long time. The rewards from the main and side quests ended up keeping me overleveled for, again, about 15 hours. 
thankfully I was really enjoying the story, more on that later, or I might have dropped this game long before it really started to show its true potential. I understand that the early part of the game should be easy so that you can get the player comfortable with the feel of the game, but I feel like the relative difficulty should have started ramping up long before it did, and I wouldn't be surprised if people give up on this game before it really gets good. Another issue is with the UI in general. I almost never talk about UI stuff in any real detail in my videos because typically there isn't that much to talk about. Most of the time it just does its job and maybe serves a stylistic purpose as well. Occasionally, you'll get something like a Ubisoft game that'll just stuff a ton of shit in there, but even that's just a mild annoyance, really. But Monster Girl 1000 has serious issues with how it presents info to the players. In combat, all effects and statuses that are applied to any combatant are represented by a tiny icon in their space. All well and good conceptually, except for the fact that it's difficult to figure out what the fuck any of it means. You can figure some of it out. For example, if you use a defense debuff, you can probably guess that the new icon represents that but plenty of abilities trigger multiple effects. There might be an interaction causing an effect you didn't realize beforehand. Sometimes enemies will hit you with new stuff you don't recognize. So you'll see these icons and know that something isn't normal, but you have no idea what it is or how to react to it, which is a bit of a problem in a game that's all about using and adapting to status effects. And there is an in-game glossary available from the overworld, but it's not much help in this instance. You can read through all the status effects you've encountered to see how they work, but you don't get to see the icon that represents it, so you still don't know what that fucking picture on your character means. You will figure a lot of it out eventually, but it really takes some doing. But this isn't just a combat thing. In the upgradable hub, which I'll go into more depth on in a bit, you can obtain a bunch of different special resources that you can spend on upgrades via special shops. These resources are split into soft tiers. When you obtain them, you're told what they are in words, but when an upgrade requires them, it'll only show icons. And a lot of the upgrade shops don't even hide options you've already purchased, so it's really fucking annoying to figure out which ones you still have left to obtain, or even if you need anything else. I never really knew how all that was flowing, and it's because the game dumped a bunch of information on me that was damn near impossible to properly parse through. This kind of thing was a persistent issue, and a lot of my game knowledge by the end of my time felt like it was acquired despite the game's efforts to present it to me rather than because of them. That's not good, and I think the game's UI and a lot of the menus, icons, and text boxes could really use a complete redesign. Because right now, it's hard to really pick up what Monster Girl 1000's putting down, and that does kinda suck. My last major criticism is one of consistency of feel, particularly early on. I'm pretty sure this was one of those Patreon-funded games where the in-progress alphas and betas were made available to backers, and maybe made public too? Not too sure about that. While this kind of thing is great for allowing indie and solo devs to get the kind of funding they need to dedicate their full efforts to a niche project, it does come with issues in how the game is built. Instead of getting a solid, complete plan and then slowly pulling everything up around it, developers are forced to instead make a progressive series of vertical slices so that backers can see actual progress being made. This means that if you make a change at any point later in the development process, you'll end up with part of the game feeling different to the ones that came before it, and chances are you can't really afford to go back and completely rebuild earlier sections to match your new vision. So there are a couple of oddities early on that just don't really feel like they fit. Like, there's one city that feels like a typical RPG maker city, despite most of the game's cities being menu-based. There's one forest section where you're walking through like a typical RPG maker game, with enemies occasionally chasing you. It wasn't particularly interesting, and there were no other sections like it. I feel like Twisted Scarlet didn't have the full picture of what she wanted this game to be early on, and it wasn't until later that things started to really feel like a cohesive unit. I get that there's not really any way around it given the circumstances, but it does drag down the final product. With those major complaints out of the way, there's one more thing to bring up, and that's the side content, which there's actually quite a lot of. The main thing you'll be aware of is the side quests. Pretty simple stuff. They act just like main quests, except they don't advance the main plot, and usually give you blessings that you obviously can't get elsewhere. There's also a coliseum with several challenges designed to get you to keep going back to try to push forward as you get stronger. There's a ladder tournament against enemies that scales up all the way to the very end game. There's a mode where you can fight elite variants of enemies from all the zones you've unlocked so far. And there's a mode where you're meant to survive as long as possible for increasing rewards. At least until you're at the point of the game where you're strong enough to actually win that fight. And there's another area that has an arena with a couple of mini-games as well as a mode that pits you against endless waves of enemies, tacking on modifiers to make things harder. There's a zone where you're allowed to fight against puzzle bosses, really tough enemies with unique mechanics that will kill you if you don't have the right strategy. All of this is perfectly fine. It's fun stuff and gives you more to do. But the big one is Mistral Village, that upgradable hub I mentioned earlier. You'll unlock this thing early on, and while you could theoretically just ignore it and still beat the game, it's not a great idea. 
The primary way it works is your villagers will gain resources passively, with each gathering cycle corresponding to an in-game day, and each in-game day corresponding to one mission completion. With these resources, you can upgrade the various buildings in the village as well as the resource nodes themselves. You'll get a variety of benefits such as high-level shops, a blacksmith to upgrade gear and create certain unique weapons, a place where you can upgrade your blessings using resources primarily gained from the Colosseum, and other things like that. You'll be able to purchase upgrades for your party like straight passive stat boosts, additional effects, and new limit breaks. I like this stuff conceptually, but my criticisms from earlier still apply. It's hard to tell what's needed for where, you never really know what's going on, and the upgrade store doesn't clearly tell you what's already been purchased. Aside from the shops, you'll also have a contract board which allows for more unique story content, including some big important things and a truly incredible post-game boss fight. Alice will also have a set of tasks for you to complete with rewards for each one. These are things like upgrading the village, impregnating monster girls, and rising through the ranks of the Hunters Association. Pretty straightforward stuff that you'll clear out around the mid-game, but it does help keep you motivated. And last, but certainly not least, you've got the training field, which allows you to fight powered-up versions of your allies as optional bosses. This scales up, so you'll be able to tackle these challenges from the time you unlock it until the end game, not entirely unlike the Colosseum. These fights are generally amazing, with unique interesting mechanics. Have I mentioned that the boss fights in this game are fucking phenomenal all around? And as a reward, you'll get unique passive abilities and some incredibly powerful pieces of unique gear. The hub area's got its flaws, but I think it has a charm to it, and it really enhanced my experience. I really liked seeing how my progress throughout the game would have a tangible effect on Dante's home. And I'm also a sucker for upgradable home areas. Like, I unironically think Hearthfire is Skyrim's best DLC. I'm that kind of guy. So suffice to say, I liked it. On a gameplay level, Monster Girl 1000 is very rough around the edges and can take some time to really get going. But once you push past all that, you have a truly incredible JRPG with high-quality boss fights that wouldn't be out of place in the game by a full-on studio. When I initially decided I wanted to make a video on this game, I wasn't super far into it, so I wasn't expecting to end up falling in love with the actual game portion of this game. I do think the game's negatives are extremely unfortunate, but I do encourage you to give this game a shot because I know it's kind of a meme when it comes to long games, but it genuinely does get better after a dozen hours or so. Much, much better. But while the gameplay did kind of take me by storm after a while, the thing that initially hooked me was the story. And would it even be an ads video if I didn't talk about writing? Since I imagine that most of you watching have not played this game, I want to avoid spoilers as much as possible. So even though there are a bunch of really neat plot ideas and character arcs, I can't really talk about them much since I would have to reveal stuff. All I'll really say about the overall scope of the story is that it gets fucking ridiculous. There's a meme about JRPGs that goes like this. Level 1, save cat. Level 99, kill god. Because, yeah, it's really common to see these types of games go from humble beginnings to battle with powerful cosmic entities. That's just kind of how things are. Well, Monster Girl 1000 fully embraces that. You start out with the goal of start your career as an adventurer and build up a harem. Not too much later, you'll start to learn a bit more about the true nature of things and you'll be put against an actual antagonist. That scales to ludicrous JRPG levels to the point where you're doing shit that puts the likes of Final Fantasy and Chrono Trigger to shame. Take a moment to think of some JRPG bullshit you've seen. Monster Girl 1000 might top that. And then, later in the post-game, one of the super bosses you'll face, yeah, there are a couple of encounters that I think qualify as super bosses, is literally a primordial force of nature. I just need to impress upon you that while I won't be going into it much, this game is fucking bonkers and you shouldn't forget that. So instead of going deep into the plot itself, there are a few elements of the writing that I want to highlight. First off, the humor. I'm sure you could tell by the quote in the start of the video, but this game has a lot of jokes. Yes, it's telling a real serious story with Fate of the World stuff going on, but it's also packed to the brim with dumb humor. And it's also very self-aware. This is a porn game where the main character is given a divine mandate to fuck a bunch of sexy monster girls and it can be very meta about the whole thing. For starters, there are just so many dumb little memes and references all throughout the game. From the aforementioned uwu to Bessie doing the Oblivion Guards, stop right there, criminal scum. There's one series of side quests where you fight a mafia-style organization of crabs who use the cutting power of their claws to steal women's panties. This is the kind of thing you can expect from Monster Girl 1000. Now look, if you've played any kind of overtly sexual game before, you'll know that they tend to be pretty funny. Since constant meme humor is generally a pretty easy way to generate immediate entertainment value, a lot of porn games tend to chuck it in between the sex scenes so they can focus all their efforts on the actual porn which is oftentimes the main selling point of the product. So I'm not surprised to see this kind of weird stuff in Monster Girl 1000, but I need to stress that this does not come at the expense of the actual story. When serious story stuff is going on, any humor that takes place will typically be much more grounded. They'll feel like realistic banter coming from a character. 
It'll be a normal, self-contained kind of thing, not the kind of humor you'd imagine when you think porn game. The weird meme humor comes during dedicated comedic segments like the aforementioned Crab Mafia, or as a one-off line that you might not even realize is a joke if you don't get the reference. And while there are a ton of references to other media throughout, there's actually only a single scene that even pushes against the fourth wall. Monster Girl 1000 toes a very fine line where it manages to have outrageous dumb humor without it cheapening the actual serious narrative it wants to tell even as that narrative teeters close to ridiculous based on scale alone. While I don't think I'd have minded if it was just a non-serious meme fest, I can always appreciate comedic pieces of media that take the time for real serious emotion. And I think that in this instance, the serious story beats and genuine character work enhance the funny bits. Over the course of the game, I grew to really care about these characters, their quest, and the fate of the world they live in. So when they would be involved in these funny skits, I felt like I had a connection with them, and it really felt like friends bickering, bantering, and just being goofy together. In a way, it was all very cozy. It was nice to occasionally contrast the insane and sometimes stressful main story with a lighthearted romp. I get that this style of dumb humor may not appeal to everyone, but I think it was done well. The next thing I want to talk about is the core gimmick. You know, besides the sexy monster girls the skewed gender ratio. So you might be thinking that this whole more women, fewer men thing is basically an excuse to make it so Dante is morally obligated to be a man whore. And I mean, yeah, but it's not something that exists in isolation. And this phenomenon has a profound impact on the world and its social structures. It's not just a gimmick, it's actually a core part of the world building. So let's look at the state of the world as it exists at the start of the game. The ratio of male to female births had been slowly but steadily declining for a long time. It's not like it's rare to see a man, but they are a noticeable minority. Rural and otherwise isolated communities are in crisis as a result. As I've already discussed, Mistral Village is on the verge of collapse due to the fact that Dante is literally the only dude left. There's another isolationist community you visit, I won't say what species they are because spoilers, where they aim to combat their population decline by promoting increased procreation. Women are strongly encouraged to get pregnant, and men work in what is essentially a brothel. Their social structure, and even their economy to a degree, shifted to adapt to this issue. In the wilderness, female bandits and groups of aggressive monster girls are known to attack and sexually assault any man they come across. The population issue is hurting them too, and this is their way of combating it. But when we go to the cities, things are completely different. Due to the higher population and increased connectivity with the rest of the world, men are certainly a minority, but not at all a rare sight. Since men are still readily available in these places, population decline isn't yet an imminent threat. However, that doesn't mean that the skewed gender ratio hasn't impacted the social dynamic. For one, men now have the upper hand in the courtship dynamic. To put it simply, men have options. Women, not as much. So the onus is put on the woman to attract a man. As a result, it's not uncommon for men to have a bit of a superiority complex. After all, even dudes without much going for them are desirable in a world without all that many men. Additionally, promiscuity and polyamory have become very normalized. Even though it's not an immediate issue, everyone realizes that it's important for birth rates to go up to increase the number of men for the next generation. And we see this in our main group dynamic. It's pretty much accepted right out the gate that Dante is eventually going to form a harem, which is a thing that does occasionally happen in this world. Even if we discount Alice's divine mandate, he's the only guy left in Mistral Village, so it's what you gotta do. One thing that tends to bug me about games and visual novels featuring a harem dynamic is that it's very hard to buy their bullshit sometimes. It's just unrealistic that a protagonist can not only seduce a bunch of women, but that they'll be perfectly fine with him banging other girls. But in Monster Girl 1000, that just wasn't an issue. The social structures of this world had long since changed so that monogamy is simply no longer the default. So I never had any problems with Dante developing romantic relationships with Rey and Bessie while also putting his dick in every hole he comes across. It all makes sense to me that they'd be fine with it, and I can't overemphasize that I find that impressive. The writing of this game makes it all feel natural despite the fact that it would be fucking weird in the real world. And in fact, the world building as a whole is pretty solid. Even though the different locations are vastly different in terms of aesthetic and tone, there's an overall cohesion in terms of writing, even if it's not always there in terms of gameplay, and they genuinely feel just like different parts of the same world. And of course, there's that persistent through line of the gender ratio that's this ever-present factor in the day-to-day -day lives of the people. But on a more localized scale, each location has its own socio-political things to deal with. There's one area with severe racial tensions between the two dominant monster species. One coastal town has to deal with the constant threat of sea monsters and pirates. And the aforementioned panty-stealing crab mafia. The city around the Colosseum is sustained almost entirely by the tourism industry. Additionally, there are nearby authorities who don't technically have jurisdiction but try to pretend they do, not revealing who because spoilers. However, since this area is populated by some of the best warriors in the world, they can't really do much besides bluster and argue. 
But even though they can't exert real power, these conflicts all serve to raise tensions and it could potentially lead to war at some point. So how does the champion, who's also the leader, deal with this? She can't let them walk all over her, but an all-out conflict isn't exactly desirable either. It's a delicate thing, and when I played that section of the game, it really got me thinking. And then there's the magic system. It all starts out pretty generic. You know, you've got mana that you deplete to use magic that your body naturally regenerates, and you absorb energy from defeated creatures that empowers you over time. But as the story progresses, you start to learn more and more about how it works, how the energy can manifest in different forms, and how it can be transferred via different methods. You learn more about Alice, about the other immortal beings in the world, and you go deep into the history of the world, including its creation and the overall metaphysics. Unfortunately, so much of that fucking awesome shit is spoilery, so I can't talk about it here. I really do want you to experience this game for yourself. There are a lot of interesting ideas explored, and the very essence of the story shifts as you reveal more and more information. This game gets fucking nutty, and I am 100% here for it. I've been saying a lot of good things about the story here because I genuinely love it. But is the writing perfect? Well, no it's not. As great as it is, it does have a few issues. Many of the one-off H scenes are straight-up copy-pastes of each other. Like, the dialogue is word-for-word -word identical, and the CG is an identical pose to a different age scene with a slightly different model, which really took away from the excitement of beating new, interesting monster girls. I stopped caring about them because I knew that my reward was just going to be a slight variation of what I had seen a bunch of times already. And this is amplified by the fact that I'm pretty sure some of the one-off characters are AI-generated, so they don't quite feel like they fit in with the rest who are drawn the regular way. The large cast results in a lot of really awesome side characters kinda getting shafted, and not just in the fun way. You'll get a couple of great emotional scenes and be left craving a proper arc for them, but it just kind of gets condensed or outright sidelined in favor of the main story, the numerous side stories, and the countless other fuckable monster girls. It just kind of sucks to see a girl open up about some deep-seated trauma only to have it just get fixed with practically a flick of the wrist. I feel like this story loses a lot of that cohesion once you hit the post-game. And I mean, fair enough, the main conflict is over, but I still feel like all the tasks you take on at that point kind of lose all meaning. You're doing them just to do them, rather than to advance any kind of actual plot. I mean, at one point you fight a primordial force of nature, and it's a tough fucking fight, but there's no real setup or follow-up to give that event the narrative gravitas that it really deserves. And in general, I feel like the quality of the standard variety of side content in the latter third of the main story, you know, meeting and fucking local monster girls, doing short one-off quests, that kind of thing, kind of fell off in quality. Most of that shit just kind of blends together in my memory. The stuff before and after was great, but I feel like the developer just went like, oh shit, I need to fill this section of the game with something. I almost think it would have been better to have simply shortened that bit of the game because it just didn't capture me the way the rest of the game did. And I think my biggest issue was one I can't go into too deeply because of spoiler reason, but let's give it a shot. At the start of the game, you're given a specific set of circumstances and instruction from Alice as to how to deal with those circumstances. That more or less dictates how the group behaves for a good portion of the game. However, circumstances change and change drastically later on into the main story. Certain things that were high priority at one point get overshadowed by much more important end of the world shit, and other things are revealed to be pointless in achieving your overall goals. But the party still acts as if these things are high priority because the game established these things as core progression and reward mechanics, and it just keeps them even once the narrative made that obsolete. And I mean, I get it, but it was pretty jarring and it took me away from the story at times. So look. Monster Girl 1000 has some flaws that hold it back from true greatness, but everything else about it is fucking incredible. It's really a case of come for the sexy monster girls, stay for the deep combat and incredible story. To put it simply, this game is really fun, and I thoroughly enjoyed my time with it. You should play this game. For just $18 at full price, you'll get a full-on JRPG's worth of content and pretty good content to boot. Monster Girl 1000 is not perfect by any means, but it's absolutely worth your money at full price, even more so if you get it on sale. If you're at all curious, check it out. Thanks for watching. I'm sure many of my regular viewers are wondering where I've been. I've mentioned it in community posts, but I know that not everyone sees those. For the past six months, I've been enrolled in a fast-paced, intensive web development training program. It started out pretty manageable, but as the course progressed, my life became dominated by JavaScript. For a while, I was able to get some video work in, and I did release a few lowish effort videos. But since my last video, things got intense, and I just wasn't able to get any content out. But good news? I graduated. I'm done. I suddenly have free time again, and I am so excited to get back into making videos. I really missed this. Thank you all for being so patient, and oh yeah, as soon as I'm done with this video, I'm getting started with Kichikwo Rants. I owe it to you. Big thank you to my patrons, and I can't believe I have any left, 
especially my god tier supporters Bulk Squat Thrust and Michael Rotolo. If you'd like to join them and get perks such as your name in videos and early access to future content, check out Patreon down below. And if you decide to leave a tip in the form of a super thanks comment, I will read it out in a future video. Please do like the video if you enjoy it and consider subscribing if you want to see more. Once again, thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Damn, it's good to be back. I hate ads. Get the phone, Jack, and don't you come back no more.